So thank you so much, Kia ora Tato. Um, we're really excited to be here. Uh, we're privileged uh, to be speaking to you about the New Zealand Space Challenge and essentially everything that uh, we've sort of worked on for the past like several weeks on this. But before I kind of like start, I think what I will do is uh, we're actually going to show the video. Uh, it's a, just a few minutes, just to give you a perspective and a summary of what the New Zealand Space Challenge is. This space challenge is based on Antarctica. Antarctica is the windiest, coldest, and one of the most isolated places on the planet. And in a lot of ways, it's an analog for Mars. It's an incredibly alien environment for a human to be in. Um, and it's an incredible place to test technology and resources that could be eventually used in space. It's about as close as you can get to leaving the planet without leaving the planet, I guess. This year's challenge is really around solutions to navigate across the terrain in Antarctica. Anything that comes out of this challenge could be highly beneficial to the logistical efforts in the Antarctic to essentially give us better information about what's going to happen to the climate system. What we would learn from the challenge can be applied to all of the space exploration missions that we go forward in the future. The whole goal of this is to free the entire community of people that are interested in these kind of projects and share and learn together. Students, academics, entrepreneurs, tech companies, people who just like playing around with data, anyone is encouraged to think about this space challenge. It's a great opportunity for people to let their imagination run freely and to then take those ideas and really put the theory to practice. And I can't wait to see what comes out. and why we're here in New Zealand, you know, why space, why New Zealand and space, and why the space challenge in New Zealand. So um, I'll start out first with uh, what Jivin was mentioning earlier. Um, we are actually, oh, sorry. Yeah, so we're fellows of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship Program. So this, this uh, program just started this year. It's for entrepreneurs and investors to come to New Zealand, but it's also available for Kiwis, uh, to work on a really impactful project that can globally scale. Uh, so we applied, uh, there was about like 300 applicants. We got downsized to 28 um, of the, the group in the cohort. And so we're all around the world. Uh, uh, for us, the, Eric and I are in one team plus another person. He's still in California. Um, and so it's like a really a, a great privilege that we're here for three years. Uh, it's connected with a global impact visa as well, um, so that uh, we're allowed to come here and, and, and work on projects. Uh, just a little bit more of uh, background as well on, on us. I am a clicker here. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so I'm originally from the Philippines. I'm actually still Filipino and American. Um, I lived half my life, uh, basically was born and raised in the Philippines. I did my, my undergrad in physics. Uh, I did my master's in Canada, kind of like lived all around the world. But my primary passion is, has always been space. So I grew up from Star Wars and Star Trek, and that was really my motivation for going through this path. Uh, so maybe to summarize is that uh, I work on uh, several startup companies um, in the U.S. like Space Adventures that has sent the first kind of a tourist uh, to space through the Russians. Uh, work on another company that uh, is uh, their goal is to be the 
FedEx to the moon, so they're still working on that um, right now. Um, and then also work on uh, educational ecosystems that are working for tech and space, so International Space University, Singularity University. And a couple of years back, I also wrote a book uh, called Realizing uh, you know, Space and uh, essentially what does, what does the future look like for private space flight um, and where we're going. So Eric, you wanna talk about? Sure. Um, okay. uh, yeah, so I started in physics and astronomy, uh, mapping the galaxy, and then went into space engineering, uh, worked on space station design for eight years or so for NASA, and uh, then also been involved with International Space University for a long time, uh, taught in 10 countries, and, and actually that's how Emily and I met. We, met in France and worked together in Spain and fell in love with Sweden and got married in Austria. <laughs> <laughs> it was complicated. And, uh, and then uh, most recently been working with in California with uh, startup companies uh, and, and seeing the power of, of what new technologies can mean for, for companies. And so a lot of our, our friends are the ones who have bought rides on Rocket Lab, for example, they've launched in New Zealand. So I mentioned my first passion is space. My second passion is actually impact. Um, I think I am very privileged to have had the opportunity to actually live in a developing world like the Philippines, uh, and then being given the opportunities, like big opportunities, sort of like in different parts of the world. And for me, I want to make sure that that opportunity is also given to everybody. Um, and which is sort of like the main motivation for why we're here in New Zealand and, and what, what the project that we're putting forward um, here for the Edmund Hillary um, Fellowship. Um, sorry. So our moonshot is really to democratize space uh, for everyone. And uh, what does that really mean? Uh, it, it's really like leveling the playing field. Today, there's a lot of things that's happening on, in space, especially in the US, and, uh, in China, in, in, in Russia, but if you really want to have a global economy or a global space economy, you want to basically involve everybody. And so that's sort of what we're, we're trying to do. We, for us, we think that the future of humanity uh, is, is really uh, not just for exploration, uh, but also for resources, um, for sustainability. Um, and so to be able to get there, we want to make sure that everybody is involved. So because of that, we created SpaceBase. Uh, so SpaceBase is a, is a social enterprise that we, um, uh, we initiated just at uh, the end of November. We incorporated here in New Zealand. And really the goal is to create and co-create a space ecosystem and industry starting in New Zealand. Um, and for us to think that if New Zealand can pioneer this, then other countries can also emulate um, that roadmap. Um, and then we can actually create a, a real total global space economy. So how do you normally do that? Uh, we're thinking that there is a holistic roadmap to do this. Um, you know, you, you, if you're starting from scratch, you definitely need to have to, to, to do capacity building um, in an area where, where space is not, you know, it's, it's, it's not inherent sort of the industry that people are, are, are actually like working, working on. Um, and you do that by education and training. And so parts of the things that we're doing uh, essentially is in, in support of that. Uh, once you get the capacity uh, and you build that interest from people, then you start birthing startups um, and companies. So for us, um, we want to help and uh, give the tools and the training for all those startups as well to incubate them and help them uh, with mentorship uh, as well to create like, really successful businesses. And then the last bit to this is that it's always still been uh, funding is, a, is um, you know, the, the main thing that will make uh, businesses strive. And so that's another uh, part that we're, we're working on. I can do this manually if you wish. Sorry. Um, so that was the moonshot. Yeah, the moonshot is the, the democratization of space. 
So how do we connect that to what we're kind of like working on today? We're taking baby steps. And so the two I the initiatives that we're working on are essentially the first one is to create a New Zealand space directory. Uh, so today there's a space-based portal that we're working on. It's spacebase.co. Um, and what we're tr trying to do is like we're looking for companies and individuals that are already working in space. So most, most, of, most people would say there's only one company in New Zealand uh, in space, it's Rocket Lab. That's not really tr true. And so when we were looking and researching this, there's at least about 70 companies right now, companies and organizations that are working one form or another in that kind of like uh, supply chain um, for, for Rocket Lab. So uh, there's already those, and I think that that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're still like looking for um, all of those organizations and individuals in the different regions. So for sure, um, uh, I guess one of my asks to you is that if you do know of individuals um, and organizations in Northland, we'd love to know about this. And the second one is the easiest way, at least for us, to, to think of catalyzing a, a space community is to really uh, leverage incentive prices. So. This is where the idea of the New Zealand Space Challenge came about. Um, so incentive prices are not new. They've been around for ages, and uh, they're used to catalyze, uh, essentially, industries in the past. If you think of the, air, you know, the airline industry, that's one thing. About uh, 15 years ago, uh, there's what uh, we call the Ansari X Prize, which put forward like $10 million in price for the first private company to go up in space and then come back and then repeat it again. Of which before that, it's only governments um, that have actually um, made it happen. Uh, so with the Ansari X Prize, uh, uh, there was you know, about 20 or 30 engineers with about $20 million, which is a percentage, or a small percentage of what like this big uh, like NASA budget um, would have to create a space agency, and they did it. So today, there's a bunch of other space-related uh, challenges that are happening. Um, and, and actually, there's another one that will happen in May uh, during Tech Week, and it's called Act in Space. This is being uh, coordinated by the Center for Space Science uh, and Technology down in Alexandra. And so, uh, that's more like a hackathon, so it's a two-day thing, but it's also for the entire nation, so, so uh, make sure to, to take a look at that. But even NASA and European Space Agency, they're also doing all of these application uh, uh, challenges to spur ideas. So why, why do we say that, that the challenges are really the, the best or the easiest way to do that? Because like for the price of, of one winner, what you're doing is you're catalyzing, for one, like a community. Uh, you're catalyzing ideas. Um, and then you're also uh, catalyzing and building, potentially birthing companies out of them. Uh, the other thing as well that we've, we've found out is that uh, because for the New Zealand Space Challenge, it's, it's regional, uh, it's also uh, an opportunity to highlight the people that are working in space that probably people would not have known that uh, are in your region. Um, so it's a, it's a way of like uh, getting people to stand out um, and then also finding new people. So again, I, I asked a question earlier, like why, why space? Um, and let's go back first to why it's really uh, you know, available today as opposed to like five or 10 years ago. Um, and this is really sort of like spurred by the acceleration of development of technology. Um, I used to work for Singularity University. Uh, that's sort of like our, our, our goal is to really um, educate people on the kinds of like technologies that are happening today. Uh, exponential technologies essentially just means that the price point of computing has been doubling, like uh, doubling of every 18 months or, or, or two years. Uh, so which means that any technology that is powered by computing will also be developing and accelerating at the same pace. 
So that which is why like robotics, computing, nanotech, biotech, uh, they're also developing and accelerating at the same pace. And because of this, um, you know, things have, have actually changed really drastically. So one example here is that the, we, you know, we, we take for granted our smartphones in our pockets. Our smartphones, the one smartphone is equivalent to basically the, the, the computing power of your smartphone is 120 million times much more uh, you know, faster and more powerful than all of the Apollo computers in that program combined. And that's just one cell phone today. Uh, so it's just like amazing how we've grown and we've changed uh, in, uh, in terms of like technology. So here's another example. Today, um, you know, we, we get our sort of like our weather data um, from the big satellites that have been launched up in space for millions of dollars. And that's like the normal traditional way of, 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 of launching satellites. Uh, and then to actually get that data, you need a very big infrastructure, like a ground station, to also catch that data. Now, well, today, you know, you go online, uh, you buy this software-defined radio receiver for like 20 New Zealand dollars, and if you know how to manipulate the software, um, and there's a satellite that is unencrypted, that is passing overhead, you'll get the same quality of image free. So, th that's again another example of you know, you don't need to be anywhere anymore. You don't need to be in the US, you don't need to be in Silicon Valley. As long as you're connected to Wi-Fi and, you, and you've got like, the, the technology uh, to kind of like analyze, then uh, you, know, you can be in New Zealand. Here's another example. Um, this is actually uh, founded, it's a, it's a company in Bulgaria. It's founded by one of our students about like seven years ago. And uh, if you go to the online uh, store, they have all of the components to actually create a satellite. So a nanosat, like a small satellite. Um, and then, so, so you can integrate you know, the components that you want, and within five days, they can deliver that nanosat. Again, another example of uh, essentially, this is, you know, this is not in Silicon Valley, it's in, it's in Bulgaria. Uh, the, they basically just uh, manage to um, you know, cultivate their software and hardware sort of specialization so that in-house they can actually do this um, you know, without uh, any intervention from any other big companies. So what I'm essentially saying is this, to, to, to summarize is that uh, these exponential technologies that are happening today has created new industries and new opportunities that people can uh, potentially specialize on. Because most of the time, uh, we think that you know, the, the space industry is only launcher and spacecraft, but there's a lot of things like in between. Uh, here's another example. So these are our students as well, like about seven years ago. Uh, they have this moonshot or big dream that they want to manufacture big infrastructures in space. Um, and normally you think, well, okay, that's science fiction. Uh, you know, uh, they're dreaming of like colonies in space as, as, as what you've seen like, in, in the different um, um, uh, sort of like materials from two decades ago. Uh, but they knew how to sort of like connect their moonshot from what they could potentially start with like, today. So what they did was, uh, you know, with 3D printers, which about like five or so years ago is a novelty now, everybody knows what a 3D printer is. But at that time, um, they wanted to make sure that how, how do you um, create a 3D printer that would actually um, you know, function in space. So that was what their, sort of their first step, and they did this by doing a lot of uh, experiments uh, in the zero gravity uh, sort of, like they call it a vomit comet, which essentially it's, a, it's an airplane that's kind of like doing a roller coaster so that you can simulate your, your zero G. Um, and so they did that around 2011, and they perfected the technology so much so that by 2014, uh, they, they've uh, launched 
two of their 3D printers up in the International Space Station. Um, and this uh, example here is uh, you know, uh, the astronaut who lost his wrench um, on station, didn't know where to go. And normally, if you lost something or you act or, or your, your, um, your tool kind of like gets broken, the next time that you get another one is when the next launch is, and that might be like six months from, from then, right? Uh, but because there's a 3D printer now over there, what they did was they emailed the CAD file to the 3D printer up in space, and then when the astronaut uh, woke up in the morning, uh, he looked into the, the 3D printer, and then now he has a wrench. I like this one because they, the astronauts never know what they're going to find when they open up the 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> they say it's like Christmas all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, so like they started out with just like this small small kind of like manufacturing equipment, but their big goal is to really manufacture big uh, things in space using uh, not uh, Earth resources and materials, but uh, potentially in the future materials from either the moon or Mars or asteroids. Uh, and now, in this year, Actually, I think they, they got the grant last year. NASA has given them at least $20 million to sort of like do the, the initial sort of like testing to kind of like do this. And I'm, I'm, we're always like proud of this because like they're, you know, seven years ago they were just our students, uh, like knowing that they have this dream of wanting to do something. And now they're, they're essentially the first company who has actually manufactured something in space. So it's, it's just, it's mind blowing. <laughs> Um, so the same way that uh, this, this exponential technologies are now being leveraged by startup companies and entrepreneurs like all over kind of like the world, uh, the big companies also um, are using this uh, these technologies. Like you, I mean, of course you've heard of SpaceX were kind of like two weeks ago just like sent his his his, uh, like his Tesla to space. <laughs> Um, and um, but so they're, they're now leveraging all of these uh, technology uh, as well for big missions. So now um, the CEO of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, also has his own rockets and he wants to go to the moon. Uh, Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. Um, and even the big uh, uh, sort of consortium of aerospace companies like Boeing and Lockheed, uh, called U ULA. Uh, they're they're also like looking at cis lunar kind of missions, um, so uh, there's like a lot of excitement for this. But again, still these are really big, multi-billion dollar like missions. So where does like New Zealand kind of like factor in this this thing? Um, again, as I was like saying, there's this supply chain. You you see the big kind of like missions on the on the, like, the tail end here, and then. Uh, I just point out that you know Rocket Lab, um, who now has uh, its own niche, meaning that it uh, it has like uh, the ability to actually launch smaller payloads. So, which means that all of the small uh, satellites can now uh, go up in space more frequently uh, as well. So, they're in a niche market, um, which is great. But you know everything in between is up for grabs. You know, so like for example, with New Zealand, uh, I always think that um, you know food is is uh, something that has been kind of like in the the main focus for 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 the country. But then you know, in terms of space missions, we need to have uh, you know food processing and and and, um, and understand that really well for long duration missions in the future. So, so you know, food to habitation. Um, to life support systems, these are things, sensors, these are things that will be needed and anybody can actually play in that market. So again, just emphasizing that all of these big rockets are working on, on the transportation, so how do we get from here to there? But anything inside, again, is also up for grabs because they're only focusing on the launcher. They're not focusing on anything that's inside. Uh, that we will that will help humanity kind of be uh, sustainable in a different uh, environment. Oops. 
Um, so the analog here is today, you know, New Zealand is uh, well known for uh, supporting Antarctic research and operations. Um, and that's, yeah, this is a picture of like, one of our friends who just uh, went to Antarctica. And, and so for us, if you look at that and how New Zealand like, supports Antarctic uh, operations, <laughs> the analog is like in the future, when we are going to have like all of these big missions and, and, and big space uh, um, opportunities, then that could also be another way of like New Zealand being able to support those missions. So it's another thing to kind of like, think about. Um, and uh, going back to the question again of like, okay, so now we understand why space is is uh, now in everybody's mind and everything is, is not being democratized. That uh, it is now much easier than before, but then why, why New Zealand? Um, so there's like, certain elements that you need to actually have a sustainable space industry. Um, and so, but not all, and there's a lot, there's several countries today that are really interested in, in, in doing that, but New Zealand actually really ticks a, a lot or maybe a majority of the boxes than most of at least the countries that I've seen who are, who are interested. So one of the reasons is that I actually think that New Zealand is a progressive government that is moving fast uh, to create those policies and regulations that would make space businesses thrive, which is what happened with Rocket Lab. Uh, there was no policy for like launching until like Rocket Lab actually happened, and so now they now have a policy. So that's one. The other thing is that New Zealand's isolation is actually its benefit. The location of New Zealand of not having anything in the east and not having in the south. Um, makes it uh, more uh, better for launching because you can actually launch more um, more of in, like more frequency of launches and then there's more launch angles as well available um, and the reason for um, for that is that there is not much air traffic that's happening kind of like in this area uh, of the world well if you were you know if you're in Florida like the uh, the Kennedy Space Center in the US um, or the Europeans like main uh, launch facility, they're all basically like air traffic is just horrendous and this is why they can't really launch more frequently. But here, uh, that's, that's an opportunity. The other thing as well is that uh, there's already an existing you know, educational and technical um, and entrepreneurial communities kind of like scattered around New Zealand which we've actually seen while we're doing all of these briefings which is, I think it's great to see uh, like uh, Orchard here um, kind of like doing that. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is that now New Zealand has the infrastructure as well as the facilities to launch uh, to space, which only 11 countries in the world um, has that privilege. So New Zealand now kind of like is a, is a for real a, a space fairy nation with having that capability that Rocket Lab just uh, so happy to to uh, to now have, um, and I. Lastly, I think it's really more about also the culture. I think Kiwis are explorers. Um, it goes all the way to the more and the Pacifica nations coming to New Zealand um, from Polynesia as being explorers, and then the the, the other step to that is like what we talked about where New Zealand is supporting Antarctic explorers. Um, and then so what is the next step? The next step is like, you know, supporting space explorers. So, oh, Eric, you want to... Um, <laughs> oh, there's my... Uh...